My name's Doug Belos. Can you all hear me okay? I'm a professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And um, welcome to the Gadsden Museum of Art um, on this Saturday. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for being here this afternoon. It's a treat to me to get to ask questions of three of the most interesting artists in Alabama. They are all both highly lauded and exhibit their work both regionally, nationally, and deservedly so. I'm so excited to welcome and speak with Daisy Holtzman, Stacy Holloway, and Sarah Garden Armstrong, who has an exhibition downstairs um, and is currently being exhibited here. Thanks to Roy and the entire staff of the GMA for arranging this, and thanks to everyone attending today. I'm gonna put my glasses on, and I have my large um, print notes, which they have already mocked me incessantly about. <laughs> Um, and today we're going to talk about, in general, the idea of what expanded practice is and how these three artists have kind of responded to materials and their studio practice. Um, all three artists have a deep commitment to exploring a very incredibly broad variety of materials, equipment, techniques, and forms free of imposed ideologies, in my opinion. Some of the expanded practice that these three have exp explored include casting, performance, identity, environments, interactivity, installation art, laser cutting, place, ecology, social practice, materiality, um, in all very radically different styles. So Daisy, I'm gonna ask you a question first and um, just a note, we will take questions from the audience. Like sometimes I think it's better to ask a question during the discussion instead of holding till the end. Um, Daisy, can you talk about how your studio practice has evolved and been complicated over time? I feel especially like when I see your drawings that you have almost single-handedly created your own language or another language of drawing, even though I'm calling them drawings and you might want to talk about that. Thank you, thank you, I love that. Um, I think for a long time I was trying to find kind of a, a place to put my work and so I, I thought initially like, oh, I'm, I'm a printmaker or no, I'm a painter. I was trying to kind of find a way in. Um, and so ultimately I feel like the drawing is the best kind of home for me because I feel like everything is drawing in a sense. Um, and so my work as a whole focuses on the idea of time and how I'm the same person I was when I was eight and all those memories and experiences are part of me and you know I'm the same person but also I feel like um, almost I've been through several portals since then and I've evolved dr drastically and so um, my work is just an attempt to document each phase and each kind of experience as it evolves and progresses naturally. Um, so while the work may look really different, I feel like that drawing as a whole is the best kind of description for them. And I love the idea, I guess, that you know you can go to the beach and pick up a stick or something and make a drawing in the sand. And we would all say, hey, that's a drawing, um, but maybe radically different than the traditional idea of it. Do you maybe want to talk about the show you're curating for the <clears throat> Alabama Contemporary that is drawing, but and how that is going to embrace that language? Yes, yes. So I'm um, curating a show at the Alabama Contemporary. Um, there's six artists, and Sarah's one of them. I'm one of them. Um, and then there's some artists from Virginia and Los Angeles. And so the name of the show is Drawing in Space. It'll be up this summer. And it's the idea of drawing um, as expanded practice. So um, no longer just two-dimensional, but also kind of three-dimensional, and basing it off the idea of to to drawing is, is a verb, that to draw something is to pull something, um, and we might think of that as a utensil across the surface, but the idea of just the pulling anything is kind of what I keep going back to. Do you want to talk about like what your work looks like in exhibitions, since some of them might not be familiar with it? Like what are materials you use or that you're gravitating towards right now? Oh, yeah. Um, I keep going back a lot to graphite and ink. Um, kind of is my mainstays always, but um, lately the kind of projects I've been working on, I collaborate a lot with my children. Um, and so there's these photos that my son, who's now eight, has been taking on and off for a few years. And so I'll take a photo or one of his photos that he took and then I'll draw um, back into it. How did that all start? Um, 
<laughs> I guess just kind of naturally, um, in the sense that when he was a toddler, um, I was looking at how he would take kind of what I might consider utilitarian things around the house, and he would kind of use them as toys and kind of reinvent them as a function or as a shape or as a something kind of enticing for himself. So I started looking at what his toys were and trying to reinvent them as something enticing for myself um, as a way to kind of have a natural give and take. And then so, um, and then for a while there was kind of a period of, or a series of works where I would take his drawings and layer my drawings in on top, and then he would draw back in on top of my work. Um, because for a while he's very expressive and free with his work, so it kind of worked really well. Um, he's eight now, so he's a lot more kind of literal um, <laughs> in kind of his expectations. And so he likes to take a photo that uh, he feels like is, is a good photo, and then I can put on what I think is a good drawing, and, and we're both happy. <laughs> so. It's, it's interesting to think about like why mm -hmm. artists go into expanded practice and like, you know, like I can't even imagine juggling motherhood and an artistic career. But, you know, often I talk about like the invisible labor that some artists have to yeah. um, deal with. And it, it seems like it's an interesting way to kind of complicate your artistic practice, if that makes sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think that. Um... And you've you've yeah. you've kind of used a lot of different material sources when you have responded to him, which is interesting too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that in some way, maybe when we're starting out as a student, all right. I guess I should. I'm just speaking for myself. Um, when I was starting out as a student you feel kind of a pressure to isolate your artwork from other things. And then even when you have these things going on in your day-to-day -day life, you're like, oh no, I'm trying to do a really good job on my projects and on my work or something. Um, and I think that that's a really kind of artificial way of, of thinking about it because it's the complexities of our life that give depth and meaning to our work. And so they can only exist, you know, intrinsically and, and layered within each other. Um, and so to kind of try to isolate them it's problematic. <laughs> so just by kind of embracing them for what they are and pursuing them is kind of the richest way to, for both, I think. Sounds good. Stacy, can you talk a little bit about your expanded practice and where it draws its inspiration from and maybe where it's going? Your work encompasses a keen sense of the history of craft, but also embraces a, a very wide variety of materials at the same time sometimes in installation. Hello, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Gadsden Museum and uh, Ray for having us and hosting this too. But um, yeah, I uh, I actually went to um, art school as a, a realistic painter. Um, and then uh, somebody, I had a 3D design class. I had some screws that were, I got too long of screws and they stuck out of my piece. And then I started, somebody gave me a grinder and I made sparks and I was like, this is what I want to do forever. So, <laughs> but it actually turned out to be really um, the best avenue for me because I always thought of sculpture as not being limited to any material. So, um, and and so much so that uh, when I was in, in undergrad, since we're talking about being students, uh, if I needed something, uh, a texture or, um, something to symbolize something. I actually used to work at Michael's Arts and Crafts in the frame shop, and I would volunteer to sweep the studio, like the whole uh, store. So I had to go up and down every aisle, and I was like, oh, would that work? And I'm holding up glasses to my eyes and stuff like that. So um, I think that I just kind of started thinking of. Uh, I need to create a specific um, scene. I call them scenes because I'm a big movie buff, mostly like really bad cheesy 80s and 90s horror movies. I wanted to be like a um, work for Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino making the severed body parts and stuff. But so, and, <laughs> so just like um, anything can be the material. And so what you're talking about, the craft, I, I do know how to do uh, traditional woodworking, metal casting, casting, stuff like that. But um, to me, it's really important what I want that end product to be. So um, 
2018, I had I wanted a bowl in a china shop, and it had to be real china, <laughs> real ceramics. And I am, there's a reason why I made that uh, imagery, because that's what my parents called me. I was a super klutz. So everything, um, I am a terrible ceramicist, a terrible, anything that breaks easily, it's really bad for me. But I did my best, and there was you know, quite a few of them that I had to glue back together for the show, because it was quantity, not quality sometimes. But um, so I think I just like, I'm, I'm hoping someday that I need uh, to do something that's hand um, knitted or crocheted so I can actually learn how to do that because I won't pay attention to something unless I need it for my artwork. So I just take a lot of what I see, like I like this and in craft and I'm, I'm gonna learn how to do that. So lots of YouTubing um, and uh, yeah. And so whatever it needs to be, I just investigate it, or sometimes would you know, as a professor, you know this is the book, you guys, is that you just have to learn something that you may not know that one of your students is interested in too. So uh, I'm always like, let's learn it together. I don't know how to do that, but we can do it together. So um, I don't know if I answered your question or not. It's good. But. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a moderated panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's on trial. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Uh, at first, Sarah put, uh, I was the mediator, not the moderator, and I was yeah. like, okay, I'm not, I'm not. This is not a cat feed that I'm mediating. It's so funny. But I've known, St I think I've known Stacy the longest. Ten years. Of, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. um, I remember when she first got there, she'd be like, Doug, do you want to come like do a knitting demo or like a sewing demo? And I was like, okay, it's interesting. But like, to, to me, like, all the best teachers are great students and all the yep. best students are great teachers. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and like, I do feel like with your work, like, sometimes it's like almost mind blowing how many materials and how many processes you're able to juggle very successfully, which is really cool. But also you seem to have like a really good, like beginner mind kind of That's what I was idea gonna behind say. it. Yeah, you know? I, I was gonna mention that most people don't try something new because they, they can't get started. Yeah. And um, I was always the kid that would jump head first in that shallow, you know, just like, don't care, don't know what's in front of me, but I'm gonna try it and I'm gonna do it like, do it right, like no baby steps, just jumping in. So I think that that sometimes is what you need to do. But of course, like if you're working with materials and stuff that are really expensive or you need a, it's a really big installation, of course do the maquettes, which this woman is wonderful at doing the little maquettes, I love them. Um, you know, but but just try like get get started, and then for me, that's always been like once I'm started, um, I have OCD, so I am invested, like I am obsessed until it's done. So, yeah. And just, do you find like that there's a lot of times when people talk about creativity in general, it becomes like this whole kind of not sublime thing at all, but like. I just love your creative energy, if that makes sense. And like, I think that ties into beginner mind and also yeah. just like this idea that I'm gonna make it work no matter what. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, times where some colleagues will come in, they're like, oh, I didn't know you knew how to do that. I'm like, I don't, <laughs> we're gonna see what happens. And sometimes it's bad, but who, you know, just mess up, you know? And that's, you know, that's how, you know, like now I know, I, I know I'm klutzy with ceramics. I'm not good at it. I know, but I'm good with metal casting and, you know, so, you know, you learn what you like and what you don't like, but, um, cause now if there's something that I don't like to do, I'll just find somebody who can do it and pay them to do it as, and put it in my installation. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Sarah told me that uh, my question for her is very convoluted. <laughs> <laughs> but Sarah also uses a wide variety of materials and processes as well as technology, mm -hmm. um, which takes a lot to, as far as expanded thing goes, I think that's one of the things that's a big hurdle for me because like, mm -hmm. I don't do that. I'm very 19th century in my work. Um, I don't even use electricity most of the time. <laughs> um, but you know, how does your use of materials and ideas does it break with established conventions or embrace them, do you think? 
I think it does both, but I'm going to take back on the thing <laughs> with the maquettes and doing. Um, like, I do do maquettes and I do models, and an atrium commission that I had, I did a model and it was accepted. I had no earthly idea how to do it, to build it though. So, you know, that just, uh, it gives you problems, you know, <laughs> and like money. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, but I think that I think we all sort of do go and get what we need mm -hmm. and find out how uh, I do not really ever have a, a, a image of what something's going to completely look at look like. I end up progressing slowly with trying to figure it out, and I'm always searching. And the same thing with the paintings, the sculpture. And um, I do know when I've I've gotten it, and it's so it's it is a hunt with materials and technology. Um, some one of the pieces, the back piece that has the light downstairs, that was done in the '90s, early '90s, and it was very different. And but I I knew I wanted to use it here, and so but there's so much with light that has now been done and changes. Uh, so much more, so, you know, the LED, the LED strip. Um, I am not that great at knowing all of this, but I definitely know how to find the people yeah. that can help with it. And, uh, and I don't mind, you know, I will spend money ordering all different types of samples and, and see what will happen. And um, you sort of slowly build that up. So, yes, I like technology. But I'm not a tech person, and but um, and I use it. And a lot of the sort of breathing down there is, um, you know, I've always been, I've always worked with people, and uh, or had friends and go like the uh, the sort of X and Y piece down there, the two side by side sort of caskets. Um, there was uh, I became friends with somebody in the robotics lab at NYU way back there, and. That's how I get the connection of the blowing and the sucking and the blowing. You know, he was just so smart. And so there's just so many great people out there that sort of help you get, figure out what it is. And I don't ever really become, you know, I'm not efficient at it. I'm not going to be an electronics person because I need so many different things for uh, different pieces going in different directions. Now tell me what some more of the question was there. <laughs> I, I think it's really interesting because, you know, like we all have very complicated studio practices. And one of the things I talk about, like when I'm in other states exhibiting is like people don't realize that y'all exist in Alabama in a way. And to me, like it's, it's one thing to go to a museum, but we're talking about expanded practice and like I really – you know, love that I've met all of y'all and been able to do like studio visits or talk to you outside mm -hmm. of exhibitions because sometimes those generate the most interesting mm -hmm. discussions. And and I literally met Sarah because someone told her to call me at one point <laughs> to find out how to do something. And like you got me the person to work with me. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but you know, like artist houses are really interesting to visit and artist studios are really interested to interesting to visit because like Sarah, we're all site specific installation yeah. artists, kind of in yeah. radically different ways, but man, they're all really so different. But how do you guys feel about like expanding your artistic careers beyond museums or into other possible Sarah, Sarah always gets mad at me because I don't document my work. Like, she is just <laughs> like, <I> what? <laughs> and she does. I don't make maquettes. I make these crazy gibberish lists and drawings, but I don't make but maquettes. But that's your way of sketching. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's my way yeah. of seeing and yes. realizing something because sometimes I'm trying to climb a mountain that I don't know how to climb. Mm -hmm. We all are trying to climb yeah. that mountain. We but I think know. that's interesting for us mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. talk about. That we just, know. but you yeah. don't know. You're trying to see. I'm, I'm always trying to see. Yeah. And how do you see? For me, it is making those models, changing them. Then when you get in the space, you can you continue to change. You just hope you have enough time to make it work. Yeah. 
Well, and I just wanted to go off of what Sarah was saying is that sometimes you don't need somebody who's a specialist in something. Uh -huh. Sometimes you're like, I need a motor that runs slow. I'll just go to Walmart and get one of these little turkey roasters or something <laughs> like rotisserie chicken. That's what it is. So, or like what I try and think what exists already that does what I need it to do. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Well, and you do. I mean, like I had with the one I had to blow up a glue gun. How was I going to blow the goo glue gun up? <laughs> and finally, it was gel medium on glass that I would wrap. Yeah. But it's just, you know. You had you, to blow a glue, glue I, gun you up? Blow it up. Yeah. Oh, make it bigger. Make it bigger. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. uh, no, excuse me. <laughs> Does monumentalism not actually explosion? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you guys about is that we all kind of work in series, not the same way. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about how you build your like major exhibitions, like solo exhibitions in large spaces? And, and how do you decide what is included in those exhibitions and how the viewers going to be involved? I think you should talk about yours down there. You know, that's okay. it. Well, so, you know, this is the last stop for this show. So I've had the experience of six different spaces. This is the six. And it has been really interesting thinking about, for, so the spaces were from a very, sort of the Berry College, which is about half, about this size, to 8,000 square feet. So those spaces, and then the 8,000 square feet was a warehouse without wall. I mean, it had walls, but you didn't want to emphasize the walls. So it's in here is just, it, they're just so different that you really had to think about how and what work and how was the, the sound, how was the movement, how was the, the, all the things, how it would move around. And so again, I did models, not at first because I was so rushed at that, but I did drawings and just trying to get to understand it. And then you are going to change it when you're in the space because there's a physicality about the space, and um, and it's been it's been great getting to have this experience and uh, to understand you know to think about what could work and what couldn't work, and but this body of work is over from 1978 to today, so it was a lot of a lot. <laughs> Daisy, you want to talk a little bit? Yeah, um, I guess, so my series, I'll, I'll, I'll usually start off with a whole bunch. Like, I think, like, I'm going to have, the, like, I have 20 pieces of paper. I'm going to make this series about whatever it is I'm thinking about or something. Um, but at some point, it just kind of naturally breaks off, and you realize that this one doesn't fit with the others mm -hmm. as a family, as it makes sense. And so you just kind of have to set it aside, and it becomes something else. It becomes like this offshoot, and that's the start for something else. Um or you need more, you know, the opposite could happen. You have to keep building more and more because you haven't said it all yet. Um, but I think as far as shows, you know, I, I tend to have a show that like, I feel like is based off of a project um, or a series of works. Um, and then either, I guess usually there's more space than that fits that one. So then I figure out which project kind of complements it um, and how they can kind of coexist together um, as far as building the work. But, um, I guess I also really love two-person shows. Um, so my husband and I show together a lot. He's a sculptor. Um, and so there's kind of a fun dance that happens as far as like which works are speaking to each other and where we could put them together. Um, it, it's just really beautiful, I think, kind of the idea of, of seeing him in a different way and seeing his work in a different way, but then also using it as a way to think of my works in a different way, I guess. Stacy, um, I tend to think of my piece at late in the last 10 years, I've been trying to make big installations that can come apart and become something else. So a, a single installation doesn't really get set up the same way, probably very similar to Sarah um, in this space, uh, in a different space. So it's like that, uh, installation only lives for the duration of the exhibition. 
I think. And then once it comes down, these are all parts that I can then play with and take like this from this other installation, put them together and do all this fun stuff together. But I think um, for a while now, I've been working kind of within the same um, uh, conceptually different ideas, but aesthetically all similar so that everything went together. So it, sometimes it's like, okay, I got to show what do I have done? <laughs> um, and then you start with like, well, this is the biggest piece and this is the only place where it can go. And then just kind of play stuff around it and see what happens. But, um, but now something's happening where I've changed. Uh, I went in a new direction and I'm working with a lot of light fixtures and the work is very, um, it's like light and dark. And so it's very, very different aesthetically. And I feel like I can't show them together. So it's, um, I'm kind of in a different realm right now with that where I've always kind of been able to play, but now it's like, oh gosh, I gotta get all this done in time. So I have enough work to show at this gallery. So um, I think it's okay to kind of go back and forth with how you set up things. Um, and don't be afraid to like show older work because, you know, even though like that, you know, like that's a piece that you showed here, but this place hasn't seen that piece, you know? So, um, so Sometimes, yeah, just using old pieces and putting it with something new is kind of like my favorite thing to do, so. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up like uh, that idea of like when to stop showing work or how, mm -hmm. how what work is too old because like I think that's something that in the contemporary art world has changed a lot because there yeah. used to be more of like a set idea about that outside of retrospectives, mm -hmm. which is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but does anyone have a question? And if people in the audience have a question, I'll repeat your question so it's uh, mic'd. And if you don't have questions, I have a lot more questions. <laughs> but I would love to get yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what aspects of business are there any visual tools that help with planning? Okay, so they, <laughs> yeah, so they were asking um, outside of traditional like material processes, is anyone using digital processes? Which I think is obvious Sarah's using a, a lot and stuff, but you guys can answer too. Well, yeah, I've mostly been using um, like the equivalent to uh, making a lamp um, so doing all different sconces and stuff, but a lot of, uh, I've kind of had to become a semi-electrician with the last stuff, but um, in teaching, I do uh, 3D printing um, and we're doing CNC routing and uh, laser etching, both Doug and I. So I think that's a lot, but that, um, I do that for my students. I don't necessarily find it to be very helpful for me because I have to have hands-on materials and hands on keyboard doesn't work for me. I don't like, I don't like that. I, I'm, it's just not me. And I, I, you know, a lot of the students love it and that's great and that's their flow. But for me, it doesn't really work. But there's times where I'm like, I could be so much more efficient if I learned how to do this in the computer and had a thing printed off. But instead, I'd rather make a mold and like do it myself and over and over again. It, maybe it's like torture, self-torture, <laughs> I don't know. You were asking in the planning stages, the digital? Or to You know, I, I think even just something as simple as being able to photograph and look at the photograph of what the work looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we all are sort of affected by today, even though as a lot a lot of us are much more touch. Probably all of them, are, all right here, are, have the, need the physicality, and um, that I think an, another generation, you know is not gonna need as much. Or maybe we do, because there are a lot of things coming back that are <laughs> everything from vinyl records to. You Could know. you imagine having to do slides now? It's insane. <laughs> like two rolls of slide film for one sculpture was what I did my whole undergrad. Uh -huh. And it was a lot, it was expensive. <laughs> there were You're some right, other Tim questions. Like, There's another one, Liza.
Oh, Lord. <laughs> I'll start so Liza was asking, yeah. um, like, how has age affected the process <laughs> and studio practice? And then also, like, when we do have a mountain to climb, what keeps us motivated? And I, I will say I have an amazing community uh, in Alabama that uh, I can rely on, and I'm very uh, grateful for that. Um, I mean, I, I, Daisy probably has had the, the most life-changing, right? Maybe. Um, with, sorry, with age? What were we yeah, we're talking about age. Um, I don't know. I keep, I guess, can you repeat the question? Well, well, basically, how has age affected your evolution as an artist? Like, how has that changed over the career? Because now you're working yeah. with your children. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know. I think it's comforting, I guess, in the fact that um, the idea of age, even, the idea that we would, have another chance like again the next day so the idea of time or age um just overall is is very comforting for, for me so i guess that's kind of in itself what i'm interested in um and the idea of kind of these small things that repeat you know like the breath and like the breathing um or the heartbeat like these really small things that maybe we um you know we don't think about um so to me, that helps me, I guess, with a bigger arc of aging, maybe, is, is the small aging um, and the small moments. And then that helps me be able to handle the big moments. Um, the idea of kind of breaking it down to smaller cycles. Um, and then when I do have something challenging, um, my favorite thing to do is to add something else to the list. <laughs> and I guess by that, I mean, like, if you feel overwhelmed, um, you're like, what, you know, how, where, what should I start? How do I finish? What do I get around this? Um, to me, it's just really exciting to look at other deadlines or other shows I could apply for. And that seems kind of backwards, yeah. but I can remember, I guess, like, um, back in high school, I was really excited about the idea of a job. And I thought, man, when people get jobs, this must just be so exciting. You don't, you don't go to school anymore. You have this job. Um, and I, so I remember like reading the one ads in the paper um, and those jobs, a lot of them, it seemed like, well, I could, I could do these, you know, like there was no kind of prerequisites like, yeah, you just come in and apply. And I love that. So I remember eating my breakfast, like reading the one ads in the paper for all these amazing jobs. And that kind of was very satisfying and exciting for me. So I guess just the idea of I always try to get back to that kind of excitement of like, I can do anything that I want. So I'm the one that's setting this up for myself. And if I don't like where I'm at now, I can change it and I can keep adding more jobs to my plate <laughs> in the best way. So, so I would say um, problems. So I'm just say if it's an atrium or a big show or something like that, and they're, they're real problems. It's, it gives you a great energy because it makes you nervous and I actually don't mind being nervous. I think it, um, it, is, um, it, it just gives you energy and it pushes you and uh, to do something that you might not be able to do. So that, and, and I always try to remind myself that this is the good life when I'm so nervous. And, um, but but that, that is part of it. And I think getting, I, I think I work pretty hard still. And so, especially uh, for somebody that's that old. old. <laughs> Excuse me, but, but Doc keeps reminding me how old I am. <laughs> we we tease each other. I'm in, I'm only in my sixties, so I'm not, I'm not that old. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it, it is Liza. That's such a great question because, like, when I was a young artist of like 24, 25, like. It used to be like museums or galleries would see your work and be like, oh, it's installation based. And like, they would have so many questions. And now I don't get asked those questions anymore. And I don't think it's because I'm like a known commodity. I think the the idea of expanded practice is more, mm -hmm. has more gravity, mm -hmm. which I think yeah. is great. Cause I don't mm -hmm. think of museums as safe spaces at all. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. um, like especially for like LGBTQ people like me and 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 a lot of other populations, it's not a safe space. But I do appreciate like that they let that, me do what I want to do yeah. mm -hmm. in my own language, which mm -hmm. is cool. And that's uh, that question about you're a painter or you're, you know, yeah, sculptor or whatever. And when I would did, I went undergrad, I mean graduate school as a painter. And one of the questions at the end was, you're not a painter or a sculptor, you're not going to get a job. <laughs> and it just, you know, I think we've gone past that. We've done it. Mm -hmm. I think we're at our time limit, mm -hmm. but uh, obviously you can come at any of us with any questions and we'll hang out for a while. And, and it was great being here today. Thank and you so do. much. Yeah, please Thank do. you. Thank you. Thank you.